When I got out of the Marine Corps, I was often surprised at, at how slow some folks would be to make decisions. You know, they, you get paralyzed by not having adequate information. And at some point, um, a, no decision is, is a worse decision than a bad decision. The Industrial Sage Executive Series, sharing the stories behind game-changing executives, their organizations, and insights into today's industry challenges. Well, thank you for joining me today on today's executive series. I am joined by David Peacock, who is the president of Hytral Conveyor Company from Jonesboro, Arkansas. David, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. Well, I'm excited to kind of jump in uh, and, you know, just talk to learn more about you and about Hytral. Um, but before we, you know, jump into everything, could you just tell me and the audience a little bit about Hytral, who you guys are and what you guys do? Okay. We're... Um a uh, family owned um, private company making conveyors. We it came in, um, we were founded in 1947 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and relocated to Jonesboro, Arkansas in 1962. Uh, we make a, a high speed sortation equipment controls, um, the full breadth of, of conveyor products that you, you expect from a company in our industry. And um, we've got about 1300 employees. We've we've really grown over the last three or four years in the in terms of the number of employees and the, the volume of business that we've been doing. So it's been a it's been a very exciting time for us. Excellent. Well, there's a lot going on, obviously, in the industry, a tremendous amount of growth. And I'm, we'll get into that a little bit here later in the episode. Uh, but before that, I want to know a little bit more about you, David. Tell me your 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 background. How did you get involved in in the industry? Well, um, I grew up in North Carolina. I have moved around quite a bit. I've actually lived in 13 states. And so I oh, wow. uh, have um, have moved quite a bit. Um, going, coming out of high school, my best friend talked me into going to the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and then he decided that he didn't want to go. So I went down there by myself. Um, fantastic opportunity. I, I recognized that that was the start of the journey that opened a significant number of doors. And so I'm, I'm very appreciative of the experience that I got there. The Marine Corps actually paid for me to go to college. And so I went there, I earned a scholarship from those folks and went into the Marine Corps and served as a first a lieutenant then got promoted to captain for about a little over 10 years and got out in the mid nineties and joined corporate America. I went to, to Rubbermaid to begin with in an operations role, um, had a, a really great time there. Um, got an opportunity to, to move into material handling, but it was on the vehicle side in 2001, uh, up in Wisconsin, I worked for a company called Omniquip. We got purchased, Two years later, I moved to Pennsylvania with JLG Industries, again, material handling, but again, vehicles. And in 2007, got recruited to move to Texas to stand up a, a facility for a European company um, in, in an operations role. And was there until 2014 when I got the opportunity to come here. Most of my experience, you can see, is, is primarily in operations. Um, but um, Coming here was a huge opportunity. I'm the third president in the 73 year history of, of wow. Hotel. Mr. Goldberg was founded the company and was president until the early 90s. And then Greg Gerdner was the president until I took over in 2015. Um, so it's it's been a, a really, it's it's a, the American dream story. I mean, it's um, the where I started and the path that I took to get here. Um, I'm very uh, fortunate to be in this role. Mr. Lorberg created an incredible company. And, love being at the at hydro that's awesome no i love that i i love the hearing about the american dream and you know and just hearing that that your sense of gratitude on that so tell me a little bit like in your career where were some you know where, where were some big moments that some big learning lessons that you've you've taken away maybe you know you mentioned that when you were at, you know at the citadel you know in the marine corps there was a lot you know that you that you got from that tell, can you can maybe share a few things yeah, the, the 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 Citadel opened some my eyes to the world. I mean, I I hadn't traveled a great deal. The first time I got on a plane was when I flew down to Charleston my freshman year, um, and so it was really exposed me. And I I I um, um, became friends with with uh, young men all over the country at the Citadel and developed some great relationships to this day. Um, we talk very regularly uh, and are there to support each other. So it's understanding the importance of, of the, friend, the friendships that I developed and just the breadth of exposure to people from all over the country um, and even internationally. We had several students, classmates that were from, from Panama um, and, and 
other places around the world. So I was, that was a great experience just to get me started in, in terms of thinking uh, more of a, a national global level. But the Marine Corps, the, the two lessons I tell people that I took from the Marine Corps, the first one is um, how, to, how to be a good leader. Now we all drop the ball on and we mess up on occasion, but sure. they give me the, the skills that, to understand that treat people the way you wanna be treated and don't ask folks to do things you're not willing to do yourself and just be out there, engage with people and having those conversations, huge leadership opportunities um, and great, uh, great learning opportunity for me. The other one is a little less um, obvious and that is the value of making a decision. When I got out of the Marine Corps, I was often surprised at, at how slow some folks would be to make decisions that, you know, they, you get paralyzed by not having adequate information. And at some point, um, a, no decision is, is a worse decision than a bad decision. And so I learned the value of t collecting information and, and making a decision based upon what you know at the time, at the moment and moving forward. And so that was, I think, um, a, a very valuable lesson that, that uh, has lived, uh, that I've lived with for the last 25 years. And, and probably one of the things I'm most grateful from, from the Marine Corps for. Uh, then, and the other item I think is just the willingness to, to take an opportunity. I, it's when um, um, JLG bought Omniquip, um, they offered over 100 people uh, opportunities to move from Wisconsin to Pennsylvania, and only four of us actually took them up on that opportunity. Mm. Um, and if, if an opportunity is presented to yourself, um, um, th th be open to those opportunities because you don't know where they're going to lead. And that, th that led, it was a chain of events that have led me to high trouble. And so it's, um, I think just being aware of opportunities and, and then being, having the, the, the willingness to step through the door and, and take that challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's, that's awesome. So first of all, thank you for your service, you know, not to be cliche, but seriously, thank you. Because I, I, I you know, you, you mentioned you were in the Marine Corps for 10 years. So I imagine, you know, that was uh, there's a lot of sacrifice involved. Um, and there's a lot of things that uh, you probably necessarily didn't want to do that, you know, you, you, you kind of had to do and, you, you know, you kind of had to have some grit. Um, so thank you. And, you know, I love those, those lessons, those takeaways. So uh, certainly the leadership aspect, um, the decision making thing is fascinating to me, um, especially uh, right now um, where you want to talk about people being fraught with having to make decisions with very limited or uh, constantly changing uh, information and scenarios. Um, analysis paralysis is a real thing. Um, or, or, or maybe what I've heard a lot is just decision-making fatigue, you know, is, is, is definitely been a big challenge. And then obviously there's this third piece of really being uh, aware of opportunities, but not just aware, but really just jumping, taking, taking advantage of them and actually make, taking action on them. Um, that's awesome. That, that's great. And I, I, it exists both on a personal level, but also on a, uh, a company level. I mean, we have to be, as a company, as Hydro, we have to be aware. This, this is a tough year. We all know it's a tough year, but there's huge opportunities that are being presented to us as a result of that as well. And so being willing to, to, to exercise that same philosophy at the corporate level as you do on the personal level, I think is important. Absolutely. Well, okay, so let's pivot a little bit and talk, you know, talk about high troll with those things. And actually, maybe we can run with those themes of what you talked about, which I would, I would love to expand on a little bit more from a, let's, from a leadership standpoint. How is that influencing you right now uh, at high troll? I think um, the, um, First off, is taking care of our people, right? We yeah. we have we spent a, a good deal of money this year that was unpl unbudgeted, unplanned to put safeguards in place to, so that we can take care of our folks. The, the last thing that we want is to have um, a bunch of folks come down with COVID, uh, and um, both from a personal perspective, be doing the right thing for them, and also for the companies uh, and our customers' perspective, making sure that we can deliver product. And so, um, you know whether it's temperatures, all the different uh, protocols that the CDC suggests that you do. If, if we have someone who is exposed, we send them home. Um, the Congress passed the, uh, and I don't recall the, the name of the bill, but um, it's for companies smaller than us. So it doesn't apply for us, but the right thing for us to do for our folks was to, to mirror that program. And so when we send folks home, uh, we provide uh, COVID leave pay for them so that they can stay home and take care of their families and not be hurt any more than and they can really focus on 
on getting well and not have to worry about the financial impact of, of staying at home, um, doing those types of things, um, making sure that we're creating opportunities to, for our folks to, to grow. So whether it's through tuition reimbursement and helping our folks um, get an education so that they can move from their current role into a, into a higher role in the organization, doing all of those types of things to make sure that, that we retain the very best people that we can, that it doesn't do any good to have a great product if, if the folks that we have here can't go out and we can't maintain the folks that we need uh, and that we want to have in the organization. So uh, really the focus is on, on the people and we do that. Everything else takes care of itself. Absolutely. No, that's great. Now, obviously it's, you know, it's going to feed into a great culture um, and you have to have a great culture if you want to have a great company and, 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 and so on. That's fantastic. You know, as far as the, this decision-making piece on here, obviously there's a lot of companies that are, um, quite honestly, very struggling. I've heard from many who've told me, hey, Danny, listen, we're really just, honestly, we're a little paralyzed. <laughs> we don't know what the right course of action is across many things from an operation standpoint, from a sales standpoint, from a marketing standpoint. Um, like, what do we do? Because things are changing so quickly and we have, we, you know, we, we don't have anywhere remotely near all the information. How have you guys been able to sort of manage that? Is there, I don't know, is there a certain, you know, process that you go through saying, hey, we don't have all the information and this all could, can, could do a complete 180 tomorrow. How have you been able to navigate that? Well, I, I look at it at, at two different levels. There's the tactical level, the day-to-day -day execution of, of the business, and then the strategic level. Looking at the tactical level, um, I got here in, in 14, um, became the president in, the, um, in May of 15. We're twice the size that we are today that we were in 2015. And we're very high tenured employees. I've, I have a, a gentleman who works for us. It's worked for us for 52 years. Wow. And he's a manager, um, does an awesome job. Uh, I can't imagine um, him not being part of the company, but we have 53 people who have been here for 40 years. And so we have a very high tenured workforce, but we also have 50% of my folks have been here four years or less. And we've historically, everybody just knew how to do their job. And as we've transitioned and grown, there's less and less of that. And so encouraging our frontline leaders to, 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 to make the decisions that they need to make to, to execute their responsibilities on a daily basis is, is instrumental in making sure that they're, they feel safe and comfortable with the, making the decisions. And we're, people are gonna make mistakes. And as long as we don't hurt someone, we can recover from that and move forward. But it's much better to encourage our frontline leaders to be making those decisions on a daily basis, particularly in light of, you know, if we have a situation and, and um, someone uh, in a key role can't come to work because they've been exposed to COVID or they have COVID themselves, then those decisions can't come from my desk. They've got to come from the people that's closest to those impact areas and, and move forward. And so encouraging people to make decisions at the uh, at the lowest level on tactical issues is instrumental. On a strategic level, where do we, what do we need to do? And we, we recognize that the business is changing. Right now, this year, retail distribution has historically been a huge part of the business, but, but e-commerce has dwarfed retail distribution this year. Mm -hmm. And being able to pivot from, from that one focus to another focus on a, at the strategic level is instrumental for us. And, and that's just a matter of, of us getting together at the, um, my direct reports, having conversations, staying engaged. We have, we have done a lot of work to make sure that, that, that while we protect ourselves from, uh, you know, that, um, if I get sick, we already know who's going to take my place and making sure that uh, that individual and I spend as little time together face to face as possible, but that we engage, we, we continue the conversations is, is critical. And so we're doing a lot of those types of things to make sure that we can continue to move forward. But it's, it's really the two issues. You, let's make sure we take advantage of the opportunities that are available to us today at the tactical level, but let's make sure that we, that we stay plugged in on where business is going to take us over the long term and that we put the resources in place to, to, to be successful um, over those longer term periods. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so, you know, kind of transitioning, you kind of, you know, um, to, to, to kind of pivot a little bit. Well, let's talk about pivoting. Uh, let's talk about those opportunities. You mentioned that, you know, that was a big thing you've learned to say, hey, look, to be aware of what those opportunities are and then be able to take action on them. What are those opportunities? And you've kind of mentioned a few of them here. What are those opportunities that you see 
that you know you, that obviously are in the short term and then but certainly in the long term um, relative to this whole COVID thing. Yeah, I think people are, have always been the challenge, right? It's and it's it, there's still the challenge. It's just takes has taken a different form this year because in the in the past, if you go back six months, unemployment in Jonesboro was below three percent. Well, mm -hmm. unemployment in Jonesboro is not three percent today. Yeah, but you have that doesn't mean that having getting the right resources, the right people in place is any easier. It's just a different methodology or different issues that are charged uh, challenging us to have the right people. And that applies internally and it applies to our customers and recognizing that what do we need to do to support them? And so if we understand that it might be difficult for us to provide field service by putting somebody in a plane and flying them to a, one of our end user sites to, to do maintenance on a piece of equipment, but what technology exists for us to be able to, to provide that same level of support protect our employees, but also make sure that our, our customers are able to have the functionality, the, the uptime that they need. And so um, that, that's one of the challenges. Um, internally, um, how can we continue to, to increase our productivity, our efficiencies um, in this environment? Um, when, you, when you think about, um, we don't want uh, one area, um, having someone with COVID uh, wandering into a different part of the facility. We got 700,000 square feet. So how do we, how do we protect folks? We have a, we have a health clinic that, that does a, an excellent job for us in terms of we, medical staff to make sure that, that we stay um, on the front edge of any possible issue that we might have. And that we've been very fortunate. We've had a few people that have been diagnosed with COVID. All of them have been minor. We haven't had anybody hospitalized. And I attribute that to the fact that that we recognize the challenge early on, 100% uh, masks in the facility, uh, temperature checks, uh, limiting uh, people's uh, going to the cafeteria, a lot of those types of things. And so just staying ahead of it, I think is, yeah. is the opportunity for us. So, I, and pardon me if you've already answered this, but you mentioned you have a 700,000 square foot facility that's in Jonesboro. Do you have other locations or you're in, it's all in Jonesboro? Well, um, we're all in Jonesboro right now. We have um, our tech center, which is about a half a mile down the road uh, that we bring customers in that has about 90% of our product in demonstration um, configuration so that we can run product for them and, and they can see what our products are. Uh, we do R&D down there as well. And then the facility we have here, but everything is, is located in Jonesboro. Gotcha, okay. Um, so, you know, let's look at um, maybe some of the industry challenges and, and maybe those industry opportunities that are out there right now what are you you know what are you seeing um you know what do you think if you if you could take your crystal ball out uh you know and and, and forecast where do you see things going well we talked a little bit about people so uh, that uh, that's going to be ongoing the other the other side is technology yeah technology is advancing at an incredible pace um right now and um making sure that we stay relevant by understanding what, what technology offers us and how do we, how do we plug that into our, uh, into our equipment. So for example, we have a significant R and D program to continue to take noise out of our equipment. Noise is one of the, the challenges that, that everybody faces. We've partnered with um, the university of Arkansas and Arkansas state both have uh, programs uh, underway uh, working with us to try to figure out, is there different materials that we can use? Are there to, to um, eliminate noise? Are there other materials that we can use to, to buffer the, that noise? And so th that's just one example of where we're, we're applying technology. How do we go faster um, using less energy and more reliability? How do we predict when we have, you know, if we have a motor that starts to draw increased amperage or you know, heats up or is vibrating, we, that we capture that data and make sure that we recognize that we we probably have a problem coming with that particular motor and we're in a position to change it on our schedule and our customer schedule as opposed to it failing in the middle of, of, a, of a run and them not being able to and they're having downtime so in, um, taking advantage of technology in as we insert it into our equipment looking at technology uh, that we can um, use to make our products better or move into a different area and then also technology inside our facility. I, I have to be um, of two minds. I, I look at, when I think of technology, how do we employ it in our products, but also how do we employ it in, in, our, in our production facility? Mm -hmm. So 
you know, we we have a huge robotic cell, seven robots that are building products for us that, that used to take 18 people. It's very heavy. Uh, and so it, we, we did it for safety, but we also did it for productivity. Not because we want to reduce people. We actually had to hire 200 people more um, to do other things in the facility to, that, comp, that complements what the robots are doing. Absolutely. So robots grow our, our workforce, not reduce our workforce. And it also created opportunities. Some of our highest paid employees are those that, that are robot that are involved in the robot cell to make sure that, that we're attracting the best talent possible in that area. But we have to look at leveraging technology in, in our production processes as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think yeah, technology definitely is a, is a huge thing and that's going to continue to be the story for, the, for years to come. It was a big story before, but now it's even, you know, it's even more. So, uh, well, David, listen, I, I, I've really appreciated and enjoyed our conversation, learning a little bit, you know, about you and about Hytrol. Um, for those who uh, would like to learn more about you, um, what's the best way to, to learn more about Hytrol? Uh, my marketing team does a great job of, of putting us out in the, in the, in the public's eye. Um, come to our website. Um, we only sell through our distribution network, so, but you can come to the website. You can find uh, an integration partner that we work with that, that feels meets your needs. Um, if, if you need some additional help, reach out, give us a call. Uh, we love hosting people at, at, in Jonesboro to see our facility, but the website will, will connect you to us, and then we will be able to connect you to the right folks from there. Well, excellent. Well, David, thank you so much for your time today, and thanks for coming on the Industrial Sage Executive Series. Thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation. Oh, I enjoyed it. Well, there you go. Wrapping up today's exec executive series with David Peacock from the Hytrol Conveyor Company. Um, you can go check them out if you have any uh, information, like to learn more about them. Uh, and this is uh, this wraps today's episode. Uh, be sure to subscribe if you haven't. Uh, you can go to industrialstage.com uh, and subscribe to get the executive series sent to you uh, and other content that we have around sales and marketing. We've got news and a lot of other things there. So you have, if you have not subscribed, go ahead and do that today. If you are uh, tuning in or watching us on social media, hey, jump in the conversation, add a comment, ask a question, uh, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. So uh, that's it. I'm, I'm wrapping up today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll be back next week with another episode on Industrial Sage. Industrial Sage is an open platform where companies can showcase their expertise and solutions to a captive audience of industrial professionals. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please leave us a review. Want us to tell your story? Go to industrialsage.com. This week's episode was produced by Rika Wiersma, filming by Donovan Jones, editing by Rika Wiersma, music composed by Oliver Michael, and executive producers Danny Gonzalez and David Karen. This is the Industrial Sage Executive Series.